Our next speaker um, is uh, Sam Benton. Sam, if you'd like to share your screen. Brilliant, it's working. Um, so Sam uh, is our Anchor On product specialist here at ProImmune based in Oxford. Um, he's focused on supporting our Anchor On customers and collaborations globally, and um, also expanding the reach of this novel target binding technology. Uh, Sam has an honours degree in immunology from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, where he undertook a project on the SARS-CoV-2 B-cell linear epitope mapping. And subsequently, he pursued a master's degree at UCL, University College London, where he worked in the lab of Arne Akbar, conducting research to characterise atypical memory B-cells in autoimmune rheumatic disease. Uh, Sam is going to be sharing to us today about Ancrons, the future of target binding reagents beyond antibodies. Over to you, Sam. My talk is going to be about uh, the Ancrons. Uh, which, are next generation, uh, not, which are our next generation target binding reagents. So I think a nice place to, to start with talking about the ANCRONs is to, to discuss uh, some of the current constraints around research antibodies, which I'm sure many of you are well aware of. So when you're working on a particular project, there may not be an antibody available against a particular protein that you're working on, or if it is available, it may not be a particularly good quality, or it may be only a polyclonal that's available and not a monoclonal antibody. And also, um, compared to some of the uh, newer antibody alternatives, traditional antibodies are quite large. So if you're uh, working on techniques such as high resolution microscopy, uh, the size of an antibody itself may be a constraint. And because of these constraints and limited availability of research antibodies to some targets, one might choose to go down the route of custom antibody generation, uh, but this can be very expensive, take a long time. And at the end of it, you may not end up with an antibody that uh, works for your particular application. And that's really where the ANCRONs fit in. So there are these very small target binding reagents based on an ANCRON repeat scaffold. Um, and an ANCRON repeat scaffold is essentially a protein structure that mediates protein-protein interactions in nature. And we use the ANCRON repeat scaffold in our ANCRONs to generate a target binding reagent uh, that is very small, so about 15 kilodaltons, compared to uh, a standard antibody to 150 kilodaltons, so about a tenth of the size. And it's a reagent that we're generating using ribosome display to select from essentially a genetic library of clones to identify clones that are bind to a protein target of interest with a medium to high affinity. And because we're selecting our clones from this library using ribosome display, they're defined recombinant monoclonal sequences uh, by default, and they're significantly more cost-effective and high throughput to generate. So unlike the pedestrian nature of antibody generation, we can generate Ancron clones to uh, a range of different protein targets all in parallel. And on top of this, the ANCRONs have all the same applications as uh, as a research antibody. So flow cytometry, immunofluorescence elizas, um, and all the applications that you are already familiar with. The ANCRONs are uh, also, uh, they, they are single domain binders, so they're monovalent, but they bind with high affinity, even as single site binders. So uh, for the ANCRONs that we have determined their affinity in-house, they have uh, picomolar, lone animal molar affinity, so uh, equivalent to a very, very, very high affinity antibody. And on the right, you can see some data for uh, some ANCRON clones against PDL one which is an immune oncology target. And uh, these clones, we've determined their precise affinity using Cetalizer, which is a solution equilibrium titration assay. And these clones, as, as I say, have uh, affinity in the picomolar, low nanomolar range. Because we're also producing these uh, ANCRONs through uh, the process of ribosome display and selection from our library, we're not immunizing animals, and therefore we're unconstrained by immunological tolerance with regards to the protein targets that uh, that we can we can uh, we can target. And there's also no FC or ICE type background to consider. And uh, again, also because of the generation process, it means that we're able to uh, generate ANCRONs against targets from across the tree of life that typically might not be fe feasible. Uh, as a custom antibody project. We can also run a, a guided selection approach, which is um, uh, we can use to distinguish between very closely related proteins. Um, so we, we raise ANCRONs that bind to a, a whole protein target of interest, and then have a uh, another target that we use as a negative selector to ensure that ANCRON clones are only binding to one of the closely related proteins and not the other. So a good example of this is our ANCRON clones against MHC peptide complexes. So in this instance, uh, we raise ANCRONs that bind to a whole MHC peptide complex, and then we use uh, an irrelevant MHC peptide as a negative selector to ensure that the clones that we are pulling out are only binding to that very specific peptide presented in the MHC group and not just to the uh, MHC allele, for example. And in the bottom, you can see some data generated by one of our collaborators, uh, Antonio Bertoletti, 
in uh, at Duke and US in Singapore. Um, we generated some Ancron clones for him against um, this particular MHC peptide complex, and uh, he was able to uh, to stain uh, this uh, cell line that he had and show that the um, and was able to stain the cells that have the positive expression of this MHC peptide and show that the Ancron did not stain the cells that did not have the expression of that peptide. It's also a very flexible format. So uh, we have kind of a, a standard Ancron format, which is with a V5 and a His tag. And then you use a secondary reagent to, uh, to stain the Ancron clone in flow cytometry or ELISA or immunofluorescence. But we can also produce indirectly labeled. So with um, biotin, flag tag, and our alpha lux range, which are spectrally equivalent to the Alexa floor colors that you'll be familiar with. There's also the flexibility within the uh, within the anchorons to create multi and bi um, bi specific anchorons uh, or daisy chain them together. So this is something that's you know still on we're doing on sort of small scale on an R and D uh, on an R and D basis. But going forward, we're going to be able to uh, to build this out and offer this to customers, which I think is something that's really exciting because at the moment uh, a bi specific is something that most people only think really think of in the context of a therapeutic. So being able to bring uh, reagents like this to the research base is something that's going to be very exciting going forward. So I'm just going to quickly talk about some of the data that we've generated in-house with the Ancron clones, give you a sense of how we've been using them and how some of our collaborators have been using them as well. Um, so these are some Ancron clones that uh, we've raised against uh, cell surface markers. And uh, what you can see in these images is uh, the Ancron staining in red, which is the V5-tagged Ancron with an anti-V5 APC. And then in blue is DAPI, which is the nuclear stain. So on the left is ICAM2, uh, which is a, a cell surface marker. And you can start, nicely see sort of the membrane ruffles uh, of the on the cells as they're moving around on the medium. And also uh, staining of CD44, which is a relatively ubiquitously expressed uh, marker on the cell surface. We've also been uh, using some, the anchorons to uh, stain intracellular targets. And because of the size of the anchorons, they're actually uh, uh, very, very good for staining intracellular targets. So um, they permeate really easily into the cells, which means you can also do uh, shorter washing steps as well in, in terms of your protocol. Um, but one of the other advantages, because of the size, the binding site is in close proximity to the fluorophore. Um, so you don't get sort of that large offset that you have with an antibody where actually the fluorophore, if you're using very high resolution microscopy, might be quite distant from the actual binding site. So that's one of the advantages of the size of the anchorons in this application. And on the left-hand side, you can see uh, an anchoron clone we've raised against uh, uh, the clathrin heavy chain, which uh, stains uh, the clathrin coated vesicles, but also uh, during mitosis, clathrin associates with the mitotic spindles. And you can see that nicely in that uh, central cell there. And this is uh, an anchoron that we've directly conjugated with uh, GFP, which is why it's in green. And on the right is an anchoron clone against uh, HSP60, heat shock protein 60, uh, which is uh, in the mitochondria and shows some nice intracellular mitochondrial staining there. And it's not just in the, uh, the cytoplasm and the cell surface. We've also got uh, an anchoron, anchoron clone that bind to nuclear targets, uh, such as in this case, Hestone H3.1. And you can see the nice anchoron staining in red the nuclear staining in blue and the uh, co-localization in purple with the uh, DAPI showing the nice nuclear localization. Um, this is uh, some data from one of our collaborators, Jacqueline Schmuckley at the University of Bern, uh, who was very interested in uh, this protein GABARAT1, which is uh, uh, involved in autophagosome formation and in particular in the context of uh, uh, the infection of cells with Plasmodium burgi. So uh, what they wanted to show was that uh, the GABARAP1, uh, where it where it associated and they hypothesized it associated with a particular membrane, the parasitophorous vacuole membrane. They can stain this membrane with the UAS4 commercial antibody, which is here in purple, and they use the anchoron to stain their GABARAP1 protein. And on the far right, you can see the co-localization of the GABARAP1 protein with the, the PVM membrane, which is what they were hoping to see. And on the bottom is their knockout cell line, and you can nicely see uh, the absence of the anchoron staining, indicating the specificity of this particular clone for the GABARAP1. Um, this is a relatively new image we've generated, actually, which is uh, with some anchoron clones against uh, NF-kappa-B uh, subunit P56, sorry, P65, rather, um, which translocates into uh, the nucleus from the cytoplasm uh, upon inflammation. So, and so what you can see in these images is uh, in green is the phylloidin, which associates uh, with uh, the actin, actin filaments. 
and uh, in the top panel is the control unstimulated cells. Uh, and in the red, you can see the uh, anchoron staining the NF kappa B in the cytoplasm. And then upon stimulation with TNF alpha, uh, the um, the NF kappa B subunit translocates into the nucleus, and you can see that there's less of that uh, halo of anchoron staining around the nucleus as it's uh, gone inside the nucleus, um, which is a nice example of where we've used the anchorons in a bit of a, a sort of functional assay. Similarly, with uh, an anchoron against VCAM1, we've uh, done a, a study treating cells with uh, TNF alpha. Um, and here we have uh, treated HUVEX, so human umbilical vein endothelial cells, uh, with TNF alpha for 24 hours, which uh, induces the upregulation of VCAM1. And you can nicely see in the control uh, on the left, without the stimulation, you can't see any staining uh, from the anchor against VCAM1. And where they're treated with TNF alpha, VCAM1 expression is upregulated, and you can nicely see uh, the staining in red with the anchorons. And obviously, all these images are for uh, immunofluorescence, but uh, this clone, for example, also works in flow cytometry. So here is a flow cytometry plot for the same clone standing VCAM1 uh, in flow. So to continue on the, on the theme of flow cytometry, this is some data from uh, another of our collaborators, uh, David Withers at the University of Birmingham. And uh, he came to us because he was very interested in uh, staining HIF1 alpha in flow cytometry. And um, and he didn't have a antibody that was working well for him in flow cytometry. There are in fact lots of uh, one alpha uh, antibodies that work well uh, with working well for him in Western blot and you know other applications. But specifically for uh, flow cytometry, he couldn't get one that would perform as as he wanted. So we made an anchoron clone for him against uh, HIF one alpha, and he was able to use that anchoron clone to show. Uh, the upregulation of HIF1 alpha in his experimental model in tumor NK cells and CD8 T cells compared to their splenic counterparts. Um, and this was in a, a murine model. Another slightly different application is uh, some data generated by another of our collaborators, an undisclosed collaborator, uh, using bilayer infratometry, which uh, in this instance uh, is being used to. Uh, determine the uh, the characteristics of the binding between the anchorons and uh, uh, and their target. So in this case, it's uh, different SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. Um, so what you can see on this plot is the association of the anchoron clone that we've raised against the SARS-T spike protein with the with the uh, target protein, and then the dissociation of the anchoron with the target protein. And uh, what this BLI uh, figure demonstrates is the specificity of the wild type. Uh, the, the anchor on clone what raised to wild type spike specifically for the uh, wild type spike and showing that the um, that some of these anchor on clones that were raised to uh, the spike variants don't bind to the wild type spike again demonstrating the specificity of uh, these anchor on clones. Using BLI, they were also able to independently uh, validate our findings in house that these anchoron clones have a very high affinity. So, pica molar, low nanomolar range affinities, uh, which, as I say, is consistent with our findings uh, from Setalyzer in house. And, that, and another interesting thing they were able to show was actually uh, they uh, used the anchoron clones in pseudovirus neutralization assays um, and demonstrated that. The anchoron clones we raised, I mean, the data here is for anchoron clones against uh, Delta variant of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And they showed that uh, some of those clones were able to actually neutralize the virus particle, uh, neutralize viral particles in the pseudovirus neutralization assay, which is something that, you know, we'd, we'd absolutely uh, expect to be the case, much like an antibody. And also much like an antibody, we'd expect that uh, anchorons have uh, functional relationships with, you know, receptors on cell surfaces, so antagonistic or agonistic relationships with receptors. Um, so that's something that we're very interested um, in exploring uh, in the future. Um, so we already, we've basically been uh, generating anchoron clones against a, a whole host of different targets, and already we've generated anchorons against about 1,000, well, it's, it's, 1, 000, it's always 1,600 different uh, proteins now, and we have over 7,500 different clones. So there are multiple clones available against uh, the different target proteins, and all these uh, uh, these anchorons clones that we've raised so far are all displayed on our catalog, which is on our website. For some of our clones where we have additional uh, validation data, such that we have tested them in-house in, in uh, immunofluorescence or flow cytometry, that data is all displayed on our website as well.
all of our clones are are validated in the sense that they're picked out for specificity to the target of interest uh, in the in the sensitive amino assay that is used to select the clones. But for some of them, we just have that additional bit of validation data uh, for a particular application, and then they become our sort of qualified clones, as we term them. As outside of uh, this catalog, we can also do custom Anchoron generation. Um, and to do this, all we need is the protein target of interest. Either this can come from a customer providing it to us, or we have a platform in-house called Anchoron X, which we, can, which we use to synthesize target proteins. For Anchoron X, all we need is a Uniprot ID or a, a sequence, so like a FASTA file. And then we can synthesize the target protein, enter it into the uh, display and screening process and identify target binders to that protein of interest. And you know this is nice because it integrates really nicely, nicely into sort of the the world of multi-omic research. You know, data coming out of RNA sequencing, people pick out proteins that they're interested in. They want to do further uh, analysis of of that protein. All we need is the the Uniprot ID of that protein. We can identify target binders that can then be used uh, by 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 that group uh, in their research. And from that screening process, we'll identify uh, uh, many, many clones often, but we'll send uh, the customer in the first instance up to six for them to screen and identify the ones that work best in their application. And they can then uh, get them conjugated with a range of, uh, the range of custom conjugates I described earlier. So hopefully that's been uh, sort of a nice introduction to the Anchoron technology, uh, giving you a sense of sort of how, how we've been using it in-house and how some of our collaborators have been using the Anchorons as well. Um, and just to reiterate, you know, the applications are, are all the same as a research antibody. So immunofluorescence, flow cytometry, immunoprecipitation, cell culture analyzers. And they're these very small uh, target binders based on the Anchoron repeat scaffold. Uh, with high affinity and that we can target against uh, some very challenging targets. So. As I mentioned, the MHC peptide, something that we're really uh, excited about, and also the idiotype specific anchorons as well. And all of these together is enabling the interrogation of uh, disease, diseases and species that haven't previously, previously been uh, accessible with a research antibody. Um, so yeah, thank you for uh, listening. If anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you, Sam. Um, great. So yes, does anybody have any questions for Sam at all? Please feel free to pop them in the chat box at the, at the bottom. You can just click on the chat icon or feel free to just raise a hand um, through the uh, reactions button and uh, you can just ask it verbally. Um, while waiting for that, uh, Sam, I know there's a kind of one of the, the, the key areas of interest is it, what you sort of alluded to at the end there, which was sort of novel uh, novel targets and, and kind of maybe under investigated um, molecules that people are interested in. Um, do you want to say something a little bit about um, the kind of approach that we have to be able to enable access to some of those uh, or anchorons against some of those more under investigated targets? Yeah, so we are, we, at the moment, it we're sort of quite fortunate in the sense that our, uh, our you know, our anchor generation process is, is relatively cost effective for us and we're trying to rapidly uh, expand our catalogue uh, and grow into new different uh, target areas. So actually, if somebody has a target protein that they're interested in that is of sort of sufficient interest and we're able to generate, you know, anchorons against it technically, we can actually do the custom uh, generation process completely free of charge and add it to our catalog for then a customer to uh, get at the catalog price. So it's essentially being able to provide people custom reagents at the cost of a catalog uh, item and uh, and the catalog price is not particularly high either in comparison to uh, a research antibody. So it's something that, you know, it's, it's, it's nice, particularly we're able to do that for uh, yeah, a range of different protein targets uh, from not just, you know, humans or mice, but, you know, a range of different uh, uh, yeah, animals and insects and, and viruses and bacteria that just, yeah, as I say, wouldn't be feasible as a custom antibody project. Sorry, just I was going to ask a quick question. Um, so it, it's quite an exciting opportunity, really, because where before we've just, you know, you, as you say, you've not really been able to have access to these tools, um, the ability now is that we can actually express um, aspects of those target proteins, so all different um, regions of it, 
um, through our own technologies here, use them as targets and then identify anchorons against them. So particularly being able to generate anchorons against the, you know, a whole repertoire of anchorons against surface proteins of an entire virus, for example, or even intracellular proteins, and obviously the size of the anchorons, meaning that we can actually uh, enable them to get into uh, into cells much more easily than, than antibodies. That certainly seems to be um, some of the things that we're looking at. And obviously the flexibility of the anchoron labeling and uh, and structure gives it some really exciting applications downstream. So that, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions at all? We've been very quiet today. <laughs> Not yet. So no problem. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Uh, we will move on to our next speaker.